step of presenting a framework for addressing this threat, but we cannot stop with a simple acknowledgement or a strategy put onto paper. This threat is not theoretical, and neither should our response be. I insist that you comply with our outstanding, outstanding uh, request, bipartisan request, I may say, immediately as Congress works to combat the very real threat of domestic terrorism. This committee and your agencies must work together to review the policies and actions needed to keep Americans safe and ensure that they are successful. I'm grateful to each of you for joining us here today. I look forward to hearing from you about the threats uh, America currently faces, what your departments are doing to address these threats, and how this committee and your agencies can continue working together to protect our national security. Again, thank you for being here. Look forward to uh, your testimony. It is a tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you all stand, raise your right hand. <coughs> Do you swear that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Please be seated. In light of uh, Secretary McAleenan's uh, announced retirement, uh, representing the Department of Homeland Security is the Honorable David Glaway. Mr. Glaway is the Undersecretary for the Intelligence and, uh, Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. Mr. Glaway was confirmed by the Senate on August 3, 2017. Prior to serving in this capacity, he served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Homeland Security. He has over 26 years of intelligence, community, and law enforcement experience, including serving in senior positions within the Office of the Director of National Intelligence and Federal Bureau of Investigations. Mr. Glaway. Chairman Johnson. Ranking Member Peters and distinguished members of the committee, it is my honor and privilege to testify on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security to address today's emerging worldwide threats. First, let's briefly, let me briefly touch upon my role. I currently serve as the Chief Intelligence Officer and Undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security. I'm responsible for ensuring the Secretary, our 22 DHS components, and our Homeland Security partners have access to the intelligence they need to keep the country safe. My focus is to ensure the unique tactical intelligence from the DHS intelligence enterprise is shared with operators and decision makers across all levels of government so they can more effectively mitigate threats to the homeland. My office generates intelligence that is unbiased and based on sound analytic judgments that meets the U.S. intelligence community standards. I will speak today about the major shifts in the threat landscape. Specifically, I'd like to speak about the threats we face from foreign terrorist organizations, domestic terrorism, cyber, foreign influence, and transnational organized crime. Underpinning these threats is increasing adversarial engagement from nation states such as China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Domestic terrorism and targeted violence. I want to address one of the most pervasive threats we face in the homeland, which is the threat of targeted violence and mass attack, regardless of it's considered domestic terrorism or a hate crime. There is no moral ambiguity. These extremists are often motivated by violent ideologies or perceived grievances, often targeting race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sexual orientation, gender, or gender identity. Lone attackers generally perpetrate these attacks and subscribe to ideology that advocates hate and violence. They've adopted an increasingly transnational outlook in recent years, largely driven by technological advances through the use of social media and encrypted communication to connect with like-minded individuals online. We are focused on identifying the behaviors and indicators that are indicative of an individual at risk of carrying out targeted violence. Attacks so that we can appropriately identify and mitigate any violent act before it is carried out. As a former police officer in Aurora, Colorado, and part of the 1999 Denver Metropolitan Police Area's response to the horrific attack at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, I have a first-hand experience and it has shaped my approach to dealing with this type of violence. At the federal level, the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice leads the investigations in prosecuting these crimes, while DHS informs, equips, and entrains our Homeland Security partners to enhance their prevention and protection capability. Foreign terrorist organizations remain a core priority of DHS's counterterrorism mission. We continue to make substantial progress in our ability to detect and mitigate the threats and the, that these groups pose. However, foreign terrorist organizations remain intent on striking the country through directed attacks by, or by radicalizing the most vulnerable and disaffected Americans. These groups seek to inspire violence, encouraging individuals to strike at the heart of our nation and attack the unity of our vibrant and diverse society. ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and returning foreign fighters represent significant, persistent, and long-term national security threats. Regarding cyber threats and emerging technologies, 
cyber threats remain a significant strategic risk for the United States, threatening our national security, economic prosperity, and safety. Nation states cyber criminals are increasing the frequency and sophistication of their attacks and malicious activity. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea are developing and using advanced cyber capabilities in an attempt to target critical infrastructure, steal our national security and trade secrets, and threaten our democratic institutions. The foreign intelligence threat has quickly evolved into one of the most significant threats our country has seen in decades. U.S. adversaries, including Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea, and other strategic competitors will use online influence operations to try to weaken democratic institutions, undermine U.S. alliances, threaten our economic security, and shape policy outcomes. We expect our adversaries and strategic competitors to refine their capabilities and add new tactics as they learn from, it, from their current experience, suggesting the threat landscape could look very different in the future. Transnational organized crime. Transnational criminal organizations have a destabilizing effect on the Western Hemisphere by corrupting governments and government officials, eroding institutions, and perpetuating violence. They profit from a range of illicit activity, including human smuggling and trafficking, extortion and kidnapping, and narcotics trafficking. Their activity has led to record levels of crime and, Mex and murder in Mexico with a direct impact on the safety and security of our citizens. I want to address the horrific events in Mexico from the last 24 hours. The reprehensible killings in northern Mexico of American cities, including women, children, and infants, is a stark example of how these brutal organizations operate on a daily basis. The violence and disregard for human life displayed by these criminal organizations is as barbaric and gruesome as any terrorist organization we see around the globe. Transnational criminal organizations are motivated by money and power. They continually adjust their operations and supply chain to avoid detection and interdiction by law enforcement. Like legitimate business, they are quick to take advantage of improved technology, cheaper transportation, and better distribution methods. In many ways, cartels operate with the same sophistication of a foreign intelligence service. In conclusion, I'm very proud to oversee the department's intelligence efforts and ensure the safety and security of all Americans. I want to thank you for the committee's support to the department. It is a privilege to represent the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security, and I look forward to your questions this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Secretary. Our next witness is the Honorable Christopher Ray. Mr. Ray is the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. On August 2, 2017, Director Ray was sworn in as the eighth FBI director. He previously served as Assistant Attorney General at the Department of Justice for Criminal Division. Director Ray. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Peters, uh, members of the committee. I'm honored to be here today representing the roughly 37,000 men and women of the FBI. It's been just over two years, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, since I became FBI Director, and I've now had the opportunity to visit all 56 of our field offices, many of them more than once, uh, all across the country, and met with state and local partners from every state represented by this committee. I've also had the opportunity to meet with every headquarters division, scores of our foreign partners, business and community leaders, and crime victims and their families. And I think I have a much better sense now of what we're all up against. But frankly, the threats that we face today are very different from over a decade ago. They're evolving in scale, in complexity, in impact, in agility, and the FBI is moving forward to meet those threats head on. Preventing terrorist attacks remains the FBI's top priority, even as we recognize our country's important achievements with the death of al-Baghdadi and our fight against ISIS in the Middle East. We know that we have to stay vigilant against that threat, both overseas and here at home. And that includes people bent on joining terrorist organizations where they flourish abroad. Folks like the two Milwaukee men uh, sentenced earlier this year who were swearing allegiance to Baghdadi and trying to travel overseas to Syria to join the fight with ISIS. We're also laser focused on preventing terrorist attacks by people who are already here in the United States inspired by foreign terrorists, the people we refer to as the homegrown violent extremists. Often lone actors, these folks are inspired by foreign ideologies, but self-radicalize and operate through websites and encrypted messaging platforms rather than in some remote training camp or cave. We're also keenly focused on the threat of domestic terrorism, attacks carried out by a wide variety of violent 
extremist ideologies. That's everything from anarchist groups to racially motivated, violent extremists. To confront these threats, we're working closely with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners and reaching out to all the communities we serve. And our efforts are paying off. We're being proactive, like in the case of the man, our Miami JTTF, arrested in August for threatening, among other things, to kill every Hispanic American in Miami. Or the Las Vegas man, our JTTF, arrested the same month, who'd been discussing a potential synagogue attack and had already purchased bomb-making materials. Or the man we arrested just this past Friday, who also planned to attack a synagogue, this one in Colorado, using pipe bombs and dynamite. But these cases present unique challenges, in part because in this country, we don't investigate a person just because of his or her beliefs. And these people, like the homegrown violent extremists I was describing earlier, tend to work online and move quickly at the speed of social media, leaving dangerously little warning time from espousing radical views to attack. And I can tell you, after having personally walked through the crime scene at the Tree of Life Synagogue, and having personally visited with the teams at the scenes, both in El Paso and in Dayton, that this threat is never far from our minds and is a focus all across the FBI. Now, we don't have time to talk through, certainly in my opening, but probably even in this hearing, all the top threats that we're dealing with, but I hope we can touch on more of them as I respond to your questions this afternoon. In particular, on the counterintelligence front, where the Chinese government is now targeting our innovation through a wider than ever range of actors, not just Chinese intelligence officers conducting both traditional and cyber espionage, but people they enlist to help them, like contract hackers, certain graduate students and researchers, insider threats within U.S. businesses, and a whole variety of other actors working on behalf of China. We see the Chinese government encouraging and even assisting the abuse of incentive plans like the so-called Thousand Talents Program, plans that offer cash and other enticements to bring American information back to China. Information that is often actually trade secrets and other innovations stolen from American companies and universities. And we're seeing Chinese companies then using that stolen technology to compete against the very American companies it belongs to. We're seeing intellectual property and data theft from companies and academic institutions of just about every size in just about every sector. This is a threat to our economic security and in many respects a threat to our national security. It's also a threat to American jobs, American businesses, American consumers, and it's in small towns and big cities alike. Even as we speak, even as I sit here testifying before this committee, the FBI has around 1,000 investigations involving attempted theft of US-based technology that lead back to China. And that's involving nearly all of the FBI's 56 field offices, and I can tell you that number is representing a significant uptick from a few years ago, and it's growing. The men and women of the FBI dedicate themselves every day to keeping the American people safe. I want to thank this committee for your support for our FBI workforce. I can tell you it makes all the difference in the world to our hardworking agents, analysts, and professional staff all across this country and, frankly, around the world. So thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you, Director Ray. Our, our third witness is Mr. Russell Travers. Mr. Travers is the acting director of the National Counterterrorism Center. Acting Director Travers has been in this position since August 16, 2019, although he also served as the acting director from December 17, 2017 to December 2018. His previous service includes deputy director of NCTC and special assistant to the president and senior director for transnational threat integration and information sharing on the National Security Council. Mr. Travers. Thank you and good afternoon. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Peters, members of the committee, it's a privilege to be here to represent the men and women of the National Counterterrorism Center. In the years since 9-11, the U.S. counterterrorism community and its many partners have achieved significant successes against terrorist groups around the world. As we saw just two weekends ago with the raid against Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the U.S. continues to remove terrorist leaders around the globe. 
And over the past year, coalition operations against ISIS in Iraq and Syria has deprived the group of its so-called caliphate. Moreover, ongoing CT efforts across Africa, the Middle East, and South Asia continue to diminish the ranks of both al-Qaeda and ISIS, removing experienced leaders and operatives on a regular basis. And interagency efforts to enhance our defenses at home have resulted in continued progress in safeguarding the homeland from terrorist attacks. There is indeed a lot of good news, but we need to be cautious because challenges remain. I will highlight and summarize just three. First, military operations have indeed bought us time and space as we address a global terrorist threat. But the diverse, diffuse, and expanding nature of that threat remains a significant concern. After 9-11, we were primarily focused on an externally directed attack capability emanating from a single piece of real estate along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. 18 years later, as my colleagues have noted, we face a homeland, homegrown violent extremist threat. Almost 20 ISIS branches and networks that range from tens to hundreds to thousands of people, Al-Qaeda and its branches and affiliates. Foreign fighters that flock to Iraq and Syria from well over 100 countries, Iran and its proxies, and there is a growing terrorist threat from racially and ethnically motivated extremists around the globe. By any calculation, there are far more radicalized individuals now than there were at 9-11, and this highlights the importance of terrorism prevention. While some aspects of the threat can only be dealt with through kinetic operations, the resonance of the ideology will not be dealt with by military or law enforcement operations alone. The world has a lot of work to do in the non-kinetic realm to deal with radicalization and underlying causes. The second challenge stems from terrorists' ability to exploit technology and the attributes of globalization. They are good at it, and they're very innovative, as the chairman suggested. We have seen the use of encrypted communications for operational planning, the use of social media to spread propaganda and transfer knowledge between and amongst individuals and networks, the use of drones and UASs for swarm attacks, explosive delivery means, and even assassination attempts. High quality fraudulent travel documents will increasingly undermine a names-based screening and vetting system and threaten border security. We will see greater use of cryptocurrencies to fund operations, and the potential terrorist use of chemical and biological weapons has moved from a low probability eventuality to something that is considered much more likely. In many cases, terrorist exploitation of technology has outpaced the associated legal and policy framework needed to deal with the threat. Looking out five years, we are particularly concerned with the growing adverse impact encryption will have on our counterterrorism efforts. And the third challenge I'd highlight relates to a concern about potential complacency. Our whole of government approach to counterterrorism over the past 18 years has kept the country pretty safe. In our view, the near-term potential for large-scale, externally directed attacks against the homeland has at least temporarily declined as a result of U.S. and allied actions around the globe. But as noted earlier, the threat itself does continue to metastasize and will require very close attention in the years ahead. In a crowded national security environment, it is completely understandable that terrorism may no longer be viewed as the number one threat to the country. But that begs a host of questions. First. What does the national risk equation look like as the country confronts a very complex national security environment? Secondly, how do we optimize CT resources in the best interest of the country when departments and agencies may have somewhat differing priorities? And thirdly, if we're going to reduce efforts against terrorism, how do we do so in a manner that doesn't inadvertently reverse the gains of the past 18 years? These are all complicated questions that will require significant conversation, sophisticated conversation going forward in both the executive and legislative branches. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Travers. Now, I wasn't expecting an infusion of optimism here, and I, and I didn't get it. Um, these are serious threats, and they are becoming more and more complex. You know, one thing I noticed in uh, what was lacking in all of your uh, written testimony as well as your oral testimony, except for uh, Undersecretary Glawi talked, did re reference the, the murder of the, the Mormon family. Uh, we didn't talk about the uh, really incredible 
events surrounding the, the capture of El Chapo's son and how the drug cartels completely took over and, and overwhelmed the law enforcement there. So, and we, we didn't talk about, and this is the thing that, that was really missing, we didn't talk about MS-13 and some of those gangs that are infusing our inner cities and are incredibly brutal. So I, I guess I'd, I'd just like to ask all three of you, the, the, either the reality, the potential for spillover of the drug, drug cartel activities we saw with El Chapo's son, as we saw with the, the Mormon tragedy, but also just the, the gangs that we already know exist, and really the, uh, the current situation. Is, is it growing? Uh, how, how much of a handle do we have on, on these gangs? I'll start with you, um, Ms. Galloway. Chairman Johnson, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this. Um, I would say regarding to, to, to Mexico, um, there are areas in Mexico which I would characterize as um, lawless. Uh, lawless being that the drug cartels run the infrastructure, um, the services, and their, their businesses, which is drug trafficking. I've, I've heard of, yeah. and, I, and I want you to, con I don't want to name the figure, but I've heard a very pretty high percentage of the number of communities are completely controlled by the drug cartels. We, we have done an evaluation with other U.S. intelligence community partners, and I'd be happy to come back uh, in a closed session. I believe that's classified, and we can go through that. Uh, but we did do an evaluation similar to a counterinsurgency model that we've looked at in the war zones. And um, it is devastating right now. The numbers of our um, uh, uh, of, of uh, interdicting drug traffic or, or drugs on the southwest border has increased statistically over the last three years. Methamphetamine, fentanyl-based narcotics, um, opium-based narcotics, and cocaine. Um, their networks are sophisticated. They operate with as a sophisticated business and enterprise with a supply chain, uh, with covert and overt operatives. They're able to use extortion and assassinations at will. Um, it is all based on money and moving people and goods to the southwest border and over the border into the United States. And those supply lines are, and drug trafficking routes are defined. And where there's not, there's war and there's fighting going on. So we, we held a hearing in MS-13. It was not motivated by drugs. It was something else. Director Ray, can you kind of speak to gangs in our inner cities? Well, certainly uh, the FBI is spending a lot of our effort on gangs in the inner cities, not just MS-13, uh, 18th Street, uh, gangs like that that have a more national footprint, but also neighborhood gangs. Uh, are, if you talk to police chiefs around this country, you will find that in a lot of cities it's neighborhood gangs that are really terrorizing the communities. Um, and we view it as a threat that is unfortunately alive and well, and we're tackling it through a variety of different kinds of task forces, capacity building with state and locals. What's uh, been the trend over the last 10 years? Well, I think part of it is this, this trend towards the neighborhood gangs. Um, you know, MS-13 has continued to become a, a major factor, but we also, like I said, uh, are increasingly worried about neighborhood gangs. We have found that when you, in a coordinated way, are strategic and prioritized in going after the threats, in a lot of communities, what you will find is that if you prioritize, you will find that there is, in effect, a tail wagging the dog. And it varies from city to city. But in one city, it'll be a particular neighborhood. In another city, it might even be a six block radius. In another place, it might be a particular corridor on a highway. Another place might be a particular group, you know, 20 or 30 people who are really driving the threat. But there's almost always, with good intelligence analysis, working together with our partners, you will find, again, that tail wagging the dog. And if you're disciplined in going after it, you can have a dramatic impact, sometimes quite quickly, that lasts. But, but are the number of gang members growing? Are the actions becoming more brutal? I mean, I, I read about things that are just horrific. Well, certainly MS-13, uh, takes brutality to a whole nother level. Uh, you know, violence there, as you know, Mr. Chairman, is, is essentially part of a rite of passage uh, to join and move up the ranks. Uh, and so there's a degree to which there's really almost violence for violence's sake in the part of some of these gangs. But again, are the numbers growing or is it flat? Or I'm just trying to get a feel for the trend here. I'm not sure I can give you the numbers of gang membership per se, but I'd be happy to have someone follow up with you and give you a more detailed briefing on that. I know the violent crime rate has gone down some in the last uh, year or two, even though not dramatically, it's gone in the right direction. Uh, in your testimony, your oral testimony, Director, you, you were talking about the cyber theft, which is, you know, I've heard hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, you know, primarily, the, the big culprit there is China. 
I, I can't personally envision a trade deal reining that in. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to use law enforcement. Uh, and I think we're going to have to use law enforcement from the standpoint of having global partners, for example, deny uh, entry from you know, management of these companies that we know are stealing our, our intellectual property. Can you just kind of speak to that reality? I think you're exactly right that there's no one remedy that's going to deal with a threat that is uh, this broad, this deep, this diverse, this vexing. Um, what I would say is that there's a role for trade, there's a role for law enforcement, there's a role for diplomacy, there's a role for, in particular, as I think you and I have discussed in the past, uh, building resilience in this country about working with the private sector and the academic sector. Uh, a lot of times the most effective defense uh, against the Chinese counterintelligence threat can be done by companies and universities and other institutions in this country being smarter and more sophisticated about protecting themselves. And so we're putting a lot of effort into that, providing, being a little more forward-leaning than we might have been five or six years ago in terms of providing detailed information to try to help them, uh, as I said, be part of the common defense that I think we all need. You know, we, Canada arrested the CFO of Huawei uh, in charges related to violation of sanctions, is there a concerted effort to uh, try and, again, deny entry, potentially arrest people from these, you know, these companies that are stealing our, our, our intellectual property? I mean, is there an organized effort globally with other Western democracies to do that? Well, we are doing things with other Western countries and, frankly, non-Western countries because this is a threat that is being confronted by a lot of our allies. Uh, I will say that in some instances there are abuses of the visa process that we're trying to help uh, address. Have, you know, it's obviously a State Department issue, uh, but they're an important part of this fight as well. Uh, in other cases, there may be people who are engaged in um, intellectual property theft uh, in a way that violates the terms of their contract, either an employment contract in a company or a, a research contract uh, with a university, and they can be essentially kicked out uh, on that basis. Uh, and sometimes that's a lot better solution than traditional law enforcement. Okay. Senator Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, there's no question uh, the three of you have uh, very difficult jobs and uh, big responsibilities. Mr. Glow, I want to uh, discuss uh, one of those very difficult jobs that the, the Department of Homeland Security has, which is, of course, what all three of you do. First and foremost, keep us safe. Uh, that's the fundamental objective, uh, is to make sure that Americans uh, are safe. But you, you have an added responsibility, and that is to, to move trade and commerce as efficiently as possible across the borders. And those two are often at odds uh, with each other. And certainly in Michigan, it's something that we look at a lot, given the fact that we have uh, two of the three busiest land crossings, uh, border crossings uh, in, in the country. And so the facilitation of secure trade and, and travel is, is absolutely essential to, to my state as well as many others. In order to support that mission, uh, it's crucial that the DHS has a clear picture of the threats facing the northern border uh, and between the, the ports of entry uh, as well. So my question to you is, could you briefly speak to uh, INA's work to assess the threats on the northern border to support uh, the department's northern border strategy as it uh, exists today? Sure. Uh, Ranking Member Peters, thank you for the question. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a relatively unique witness for you. So I was the head of intelligence for U.S. Customs and Border Protection prior to me assuming this role. And I occupied that for almost three years. Um, and in that role, uh, I led a team that did a assessment of the northern border threat, which I'll be happy to share with the committee, or actually the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Um, and I've traveled to the northern border. I've been to Detroit. I've been to those land border crossings. And uh, I've been to our intelligence center, which we, uh, we, we, uh, we have stood up up there. Um, there is a vulnerability uh, in the marine environment and the land environment. Um, it is a porous border, uh, and the terrain is tough, as it is on the southwest border, but different. Um, we are looking at how we deploy our assets, which are primarily law enforcement, um, in the air and sensor capability to see individuals that may be crossing unlawfully. Uh, a lot of our, our relationship revolves around partnership with the Canadians, the Canadian Border Service and the Royal, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and their intelligence services, which are outstanding. Um, but we are very much relying on that partnership with each other. Uh, but backed up by the good intelligence collection by our partners is critical to that, and, it's, and it goes on 24 hours a day. And I would like to highlight the National Vetting Center, which is our, our global capability to identify um, at-risk individuals, which is also being expanded to cargo um, that pose a threat to the United States. 
and that is in uh, full operational capacity now through our National Targeting Center at U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Uh, but we are constantly eval e evaluating the, uh, the threat to the northern border by transnational criminal organizations, terrorist organizations, and foreign intelligence officers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ray, uh, I mentioned this uh, briefly in my, my opening comments, uh, but your uh, agency has not provided uh, a single document uh, in almost six months now to a letter that Chairman Johnson and I offered uh, dealing with domestic terrorism. Uh, and this is a bipartisan letter. I think we were very careful in terms of the, the, the scope of it, that it's not overly broad, but God uh, hopefully allowed us to have the kind of information necessary for us to, to provide the kind of oversight, particularly on something as serious as domestic terrorism and white supremacist action in particular, which you've highlighted as something that is growing. To me, and I think I'm speaking for my chairman as well, is that that's unacceptable when you have a joint letter from a ranking member and the chairman, bipartisan. Um, my question to you is, do you require a subpoena to respond to routine document requests from this committee? No. Uh, second, uh, I would tell you, uh, Ranking Member Peters, Mr. Senator, that uh, we have tried very hard to be responsive to this committee. I will say that we, I know that the department, of which we are, of course, a part, uh, provided a long written response. I know that we sat down with your staff, the committee staff, and provided a verbal briefing, which was very helpful on our end in understanding better uh, the purpose and the scope and the intent of the request. I also know that we have been providing monthly domestic terrorism reports uh, to the committee uh, staff, among others. So, but having said that, having said that, the most important thing to me is to make sure that we're being responsive and I will direct my staff to drill in and figure out how we can be more responsive and more forthcoming in response to your request. So you, you'll be more responsive than not responding at all? Well, as I said, Senator, I think we, we have been but we, responsive. But we haven't. I mean, you talk about the, the committee gives response. We, we actually talked about this last week. Uh, what we got from DHS were basically publicly available documents. I will tell you our staffs are pretty good at looking at publicly available documents. So that's not real helpful in our, in our oversight role. Uh, these were very specific questions uh, that we would expect a response. And we believe that we should probably have, uh, as a committee, and you're it's my question, do you think the committee should have less access to documents than a, just a general FOIA request? That's basically what we're, we're seeing here. Well, well, Senator, I can't speak for DHS's no, response, for but, the I, FBI. But, I can't, but from the FBI, as I said, I don't think providing verbal briefing, the written response from the department, and the monthly reports is no response at all. The point, though, the point, though, from my perspective, is that I want to make sure we're addressing your concerns. So I don't want you to take any of my responses suggesting that I'm not going to direct my staff to drill back down and make sure that we're doing everything we can to be cooperative. Well, I appreciate that. Can, can we get a commitment by the end of the week that we would have that? Well, we get some kind of response by the end of the week. I need to get more information about what's missing and what's still needed. Uh, I appreciate that, and, and I hope you have uh, prompt attention to that. According to the FBI, domestic terrorists killed 39 people in fiscal year 2019, making it the most deadly year for domestic terrorism since the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. My question to you, uh, uh, Mr. Ray, is how would you characterize the domestic terrorist threat posed by white supremacists? So uh, first I would say that domestic terrorism generally, uh, in particular self-radicalized, typically lone actors here, uh, represents a serious, persistent threat. I think we had about 107, 107 domestic terrorism arrests in fiscal year 19, which is close to the same number that we had uh, on the international terrorism front. Within the domestic terrorism group, uh, and we have about, any, at any given time, the number fluctuates, but at any given time, we have about 1,000, sometimes it's closer to 900, sometimes it's above 1,000, domestic terrorism investigations. A huge chunk of those domestic terrorism investigations involve racially motivated, violent extremist motivated terrorist attacks. And the majority of those, of the racially motivated violent extremist attacks, uh, are fueled by some kind of white supremacy. And I would say that the most lethal activity over the last few years has been committed by those type of attackers. I'm out of time, but I will follow this in the second round. Thank Senator you. Hassan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to you and Ranking Member Peters 
for convening this hearing on threats to our homeland. Thank you to all three of our witnesses, not only for being here today, but for your service to our country. And I hope you will carry back uh, with you to the men and women you lead our sincere thanks from a grateful country for all they do to keep us safe. Uh, Director Travers, I wanted to start with a question to you. Last month, I traveled to Afghanistan and Pakistan and heard firsthand the concerns of our military and embassy personnel about the growing and very real threat of ISIS-K, the ISIS affiliate in Afghanistan. I heard clearly that ISIS-K threatens not only U.S. forces in Afghanistan, but also has designs on striking the U.S. homeland. You said last week that there are more than 20 ISIS branches globally, some of which are using sophisticated technology such as drones to conduct operations. Despite our key victories against ISIS in Syria and Iraq, ISIS as a global terrorist organization remains a deadly threat to the United States. Director Travers, we know that ISIS-K and other affiliates of ISIS want to strike the U.S. homeland. Please tell us more about their ability to do this and what we are doing to mitigate this threat. Uh, thanks for the question, Senator. Um, yes, of, of all of the, the branches and networks of ISIS, uh, ISIS-K is certainly one of those of most concern. Um, probably in the neighborhood of 4,000 individuals or so, we certainly share the, the concerns of both the U.S. military and the embassy in theater. Uh, they have attempted to um, certainly inspire uh, attacks outside of Afghanistan. Uh, they attempted uh, last year to conduct a suicide attack um, in, in India. It failed. Um, they've actually had tried uh, a couple of years ago, I think, to um, inspire an attack against uh, New York that the FBI right. interrupted. And there was an attack in Stockholm um, in 2017, I believe, that killed five people. So they certainly have got a desire, um, and the, the propaganda would indicate that they want to conduct attacks outside of Afghanistan, thus far relatively limited. Um, I would say that uh, we saw um, a, attack claims by ISIS-K ramping up throughout 16, 17, 18, uh, somewhat lower at the beginning of this year, although now I think we're looking at about an attack a day or so. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, only about an hour and a half ago, they were the latest uh, ISIS branch to declare allegiance to the new uh, head of ISIS. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Director Ray, I have a question for you about ransomware, but just before I do, I wanted to uh, thank your team in New Hampshire. We recently had a field hearing about the threats to our houses of worship, in particular from domestic terrorism, and Supervisory Senior Resident Agent Michael Gibley was very helpful, and I think our uh, leaders, our faith leaders, have been uh, very encouraged by his work with them. So thank you and him uh, for that. Uh, as to ransomware, we are seeing the impact of it across the country, including an attack in my home state of New Hampshire. Threat actors target every aspect of our communities, from health care providers to our small businesses, and even to state and local governments themselves, as they did uh, in New Hampshire. Last week, I talked with CISA Director Krebs about what the Department of Homeland Security is doing to assist state and local entities facing ransomware attacks. Director Ray, what is the FBI doing to address the threat of ransomware attacks on our communities? Is it tracking the number of ransomware attacks on our country? And how is the FBI coordinating with Department of Homeland Security in these efforts? So uh, first off, Senator, I uh, appreciate the feedback uh, on the meeting up in New Hampshire. On ransomware specifically, I think what we're seeing is uh, a shift to more and more targeted yeah. ransomware attacks, uh, more and more targeting, for example, municipalities. And there are a variety of reasons why municipalities uh, are particularly vulnerable victims to ransomware attacks. Uh, we are also seeing more enterprise level ransomware attacks where it essentially affects every computer right. in, the, in the organization. Right. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do wherever we can uh, is figure out through our combination, our unique role as both a law enforcement agency and an intelligence agency, there are, have been times where, for example, we're able to reverse engineer a uh, decryption key so I can think, for example, we had a case uh, in the Northwest, for example, small business, 600 people, um, crippling ransomware attack, potentially all those people about to lose their jobs, the company to go under. But because of our investigative work, we were able to reverse engineer a decryption key. They didn't have to pay the ransom. They got their systems back online and 
a lot of nice thank you notes from those 600 oh, employees. Uh, as far as working with DHS, the basic lanes in the road, if you will, we work very closely together. Uh, the FBI is the lead on the threat. Right. Uh, and DHS is the lead on the asset, um, and essentially we work together in that respect. Okay. Um, it, it's something that I think in a lot of the work we've done as a committee, uh, we are hearing um, more and more concern from our local stakeholders about it, uh, and also uh, really want to help um, all of the various agencies coordinate and share information as effectively as possible. Um, Director Travers, I wanted to go back to the issue of uh, domestic terrorism. In the aftermath of 9-11, the federal government built a robust and capable counterterrorism architecture, establishing new departments, centers, and counterterrorism information sharing mechanisms to support state and local partners and address a foreign terrorist attack, uh, threat unlike any we had seen before. Today, 18 years later, we face a surge in domestic terrorism, and you've You'll hear it from everybody on this committee. You've heard it already in some of the questions, including rising threats against houses of worship. If we are to prevent domestic terrorist attacks, we have to start treating these incidents as, as seriously as we did when Al Qaeda and other foreign terrorist organizations have threatened or attacked us after 9-11. Director Travers, the National Counterterrorism Center was created after 9-11 to respond to threats from Al Qaeda. The center is responsible for ensuring that we effectively integrate and share terrorist-related information in order to prevent attacks. Can you share your thoughts on the current state of domestic terrorism information sharing? What does the U.S. government need to do amid this rising threat to ensure that intelligence isn't missed and that it gets to the people who need to know it? Uh, I'll start, but I think probably pass it to Director Ray. Uh, the Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act that created NCTC, written by this committee, um, uh, gave a number of statutory responsibilities to NCTC in the realm of international terrorism. Um, th there are references in the, in the legislation to domestic terrorism, but quite clearly the Bureau would have the lead, and I view NCTC as being in support. Um, so we have a lot of, I think, a lot of things we can do, and, and our staffs are working on sort of laying out the parameters, but things like um, addressing issues of radicalization and mobilization, kind of left to boom kinds of questions yeah. that NCTC's done a lot of work with our partners on the international terrorism side. I think it's pretty clear that the processes look a lot alike in terms of using social media and, and the internet and so forth. And so we're opening, we're broadening our aperture there and collectively writing at the unclassified and the FOUO so we can get that kind of information to our state and local partners. Um, where I think NCTC has particular value add is um, in some senses, domestic terrorism is a bit of a misnomer because of the international connections. Yeah. Uh, and so we work a great deal with our partners around the globe because everyone is struggling with this problem right now and trying to figure out how to deal with it. And so we can bring a lot of analytic horsepower and potentially collection to the international problem set, and then in that way, Gary, uh, help the Bureau. Thank you. And I, I see that I am over time. I don't know if the Chair would like Director Ray to comment now or take it up another time. Briefly. Well, I think, uh, I guess the short version would be that we are, in addition to everything that uh, Director Travers has said, we are looking very hard uh, at uh, some trend of, uh, for example, white supremacists or neo-Nazis here uh, connecting through social media online with like-minded individuals overseas, uh, and in some cases actually traveling overseas to train. Uh, and so, uh, as Director Travers said, we are engaging a lot with our Five Eyes partners and others like that uh, as we're comparing notes on this threat. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Harris. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, as you know, our country is facing many threats, so I thank all of the witnesses for being here today. Um, Director Ray, I want to start by asking you about Rudy Giuliani, a close outside advisor and counsel to the President. Have you communicated with Mr. Giuliani since you were nominated as the FBI Director? No. And um, do you know if Mr. Giuliani holds any security clearance of any kind? I don't know the answer to that. And um, has Mr. Giuliani made any formal representations, at least to the Justice Department or the FBI, regarding his foreign relationships, business dealings, or conflicts of interest? Uh, I'm not sure there's anything I could say on that here. 
Uh, is that because it, th this is a confidential matter or because you don't know or because they don't exist? Uh, that is in part because I don't know the answer for the whole FBI. What's the other part? Well, if there were something that were shared with some other part of the FBI that I'm not aware of, it might well run afoul of some of the other issues that you mentioned. Okay. And given the close um, relationship between the President and Mr. Giuliani, has the FBI told the President whether his counsel has, is a potential counterintelligence threat? I don't think there's anything that I can say on that subject. I recall that um, you, have, you have testified in the past um, that you have taken an oath to defend the Constitution, and, and I admire the, 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 the way that you have said that, and I do believe that to be true. Um, do you believe that your first oath is to the Constitution or to the President? My loyalty is to the Constitution and to the people of this country. And if an American acting on behalf of a foreign person was seeking to influence or interfere with an American election, would the FBI want to know about that? Well, again, I don't want to be misunderstood as, as wading in and commenting on recent, specific recent events, but just as a general matter, any information about potential interference with our elections uh, by a foreign government or by anybody else is something the FBI would want to know about. In sworn testimony before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee in June, you said that you, quote, could not think of an instance where the President has directly or indirectly asked you to open an investigation of anyone. As of today, can you confirm or deny whether the President has ever asked you to open an investigation as to anyone? I, again, I can't think of an instance in which that has happened. We've certainly had discussions about, for example, uh, domestic <coughs> terrorism threats, uh, foreign intelligence threats, you know, nation states, things like that, but those have tended to be more about uh, a threat uh, in the aggregate as opposed to a specific individual or anything like that. Has the President or anyone on his behalf suggested that the FBI start, stop, or limit the scope of any investigation? Uh, not that I can think of. In your view, would it be improper for the FBI to launch, limit, or stop a criminal investigation at the request of the President or anyone at the White House? Uh, well, again, I, I'm not going to wade into specific people's conversations, but what I will say is that the FBI's obligation and my obligation and the obligation that I expect of all 37,000 men and women of the FBI is that we're going to conduct properly predicated investigations uh, continue properly predicated investigations and complete properly predicated investigations. So without referring to any specific investigation, in your view, would it be improper for the FBI to launch, limit, or stop a criminal investigation at the request of the President or at the request of anyone at the White House? I think we should conduct our investigations based only on the facts and the law uh, and the rules that govern us and nothing else. Okay, I'm going to take nothing else as meaning that you believe it would be improper to be asked by the White House or the President to engage in such conduct. Is that correct? Well, again, I'm not, I'm not going to wade into hypotheticals, but I think we're saying the same thing in the sense that I well, do not think I do not think ethics. that the FBI should be concluding or closing an investigation for any improper purpose. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more time, and you'll either answer it or you won't. Clearly. Uh, but I'm asking you about what, what is ethically appropriate. Would it be ethically appropriate to launch, limit, or stop a criminal investigation at the request of the President or anyone at the White House? I think there should be no opening of an investigation based on anything other than the facts and the law. That's my answer. Thank you. Um, to your knowledge, has the White House or any member of the administration ever directed or suggested that Attorney General Barr or any other member of the Justice Department start, stop, or limit the scope of a criminal investigation? Uh, I can't speak to Attorney General Barr's communications with others. And um, during your time at the Justice Department and given your extensive and, and noble career, um, have you ever encountered suspects or defendants who tried to intimidate witnesses? Absolutely, and prosecuted some. And why isn't witness intimidation a threat to the pursuit of justice? 
why why isn't witness why, why is it oh why is it okay I was going to say I happen to believe that witness intimidation is a threat to because uh, investigations and prosecutions uh, should be about the truth and pursuit of the truth uh, and if witnesses who have firsthand information can't and don't come forward uh, then that pursuit of the truth is frustrated and impeded and um in June 2019, it was reported that hundreds of law enforcement officers around the country are um, inactive members-only extremist Facebook groups. Um, these groups include White Lives Matter, Ban the NAACP, Death to Islam Undercover. Can you tell me what work um, your agency has done to investigate any of these cases and, and to what degree of success? I'm not aware of the specific report that you're referring to. Uh, as I think I mentioned in response to uh, one of the earlier questions, we do have about 900, let's say, give or take at the moment, domestic terrorism type investigations. That's, of course, not counting our hate crimes investigations. Mm -hmm. uh, and a huge chunk of those involve some degree of what one might call white supremacist white supremacist ideology as the extremist ideology that's motivating the crime that we're investigating. Thank you, Director, and thank you for your thank service. You. Senator Scott. I want to thank each of you for being here today. I want to thank uh, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Peters for putting this together. Uh, my focus today is on the FBI's ability to share domestic terrorism information and other violent information with local FBI offices and state and local law enforcement. <clears throat> Let me start by saying that the men and women of the FBI are dedicated public servants. They serve this country selflessly with no desire for praise or public recognition. I understand that the FBI gets very little credit for their success, nor do they seek credit. And I understand it's only the few instances of failure that get public attention and scrutiny. The FBI deserves praise for the work that they do every day to keep us safe. But I also have concerns with the failures that occurred before a series of shootings in Florida and the lack of after-action transparency on the part of the FBI. In the days following the senseless attack at Marjorie Stoneman, Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, I learned of repeated failures by the FBI to properly investigate and act on specific tips received about the shooter in the months leading up to the attack. Weeks before the shooting, a detailed warning about the shooter was received by the FBI National Call Center. The warning was never passed on to the South Florida Field Office for an investigation or to any state or local law enforcement. Months before that, the FBI was warned about the shooter through a comment on a YouTube video, which someone with the shooter's name stated that I'm going to be a professional school shooter. I understand the FBI gets a high volume of tips, but it appears the FBI did nothing with this detailed information of an imminent threat. We're also aware of similar instances of pre-attack notifications received by the FBI regarding other attacks in Florida, including at the Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale Airport, the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, and the Tallahassee Yoga Studio. Since that time, I have repeatedly sought information from you, Director Ray, regarding the steps you've taken to hold accountable those within your agency responsible for those failures. I ask for two things. First, has anyone been held accountable? And second, what changes have been made to prevent this from happening again? So, so far, I've gotten, I've gotten very little information. As governor, when this happened, I asked for an explanation, and I was told nothing. I got no information back. And as a U.S. Senator, I was asked, I put together a letter and asked for information on accountability and what changes. Again, I got little, little information. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have, I want to enter in the record the correspondence I've received. Without objection. Uh, I sent and received. Without objection. The Parkland families have also told me that they have not gotten answers. So uh, I'm asking today, has anyone from the FBI been held accountable for the failures that followed the attack of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas? Have they, how have they been held accountable and what changes have been made. Look, I get it, the attack was 100% the fault of an evil person, it's not, the, it's not the responsibility for FBI, and people make mistakes. But the failure to act on specific information given to the FBI that could have stopped this evil person requires action to correct the errors. I recently introduced the TIPS Act, which will require the FBI to be more proactive with sharing information with local and state officials. I also like your feedback on that proposal. But the first, if you could just talk about Parkland. Thank you, Senator. Uh, well, first, let me say um, that the 
Second, uh, we've made extensive changes. I immediately after the Parkland shooting dispatched a large special inspection team into sieges, which is where our public call center is. Uh, and as a result of that, a number of changes have been made. And without going into all the detail, let me just give you a few of the, the key points. First, we've increased staffing significantly, both at the line level and the supervisor level. Second, we've enhanced the training significantly. Third, we've enhanced the technology significantly. Fourth, we've added more oversight. Fifth, and this goes to parts of, the, of your question, uh, we've put in place an entirely new leadership team with a wealth of experience. Uh, and we've made other personnel changes, some of them disciplinary in nature, partly because of uh, pending litigation against us and because of privacy implications is a limit to how much detail I can really go into on the personnel front. Uh, but there are significant changes that have been made. I actually have personally gone out there, not once but twice, first to see what it was like before, and second, now to see how it's changed since then. And I've actually sat in the midst of the call operators, put on the headset, and listened as they dealt with the calls and watched how it happens. Uh, and I can tell you that there's an incredible amount of really good work going down there. Just, you mentioned the volume issue. I think it's important for people to understand that on any given day, on any given day, our call center up there gets more than 3,000 <coughs> tips. Of those 3,000 tips, about 60 a day, that's 60 tips a day, are potential threats to life. So there's a huge amount of wheat having to get separated from the chaff there. Of the 60, probably about 80% of them have no federal nexus whatsoever. And so we're looking at ways, and I know that that's the goal now coming around to your uh, legislation, that's a goal that I think we share, which is how can we get the right information, that's key word, the right actionable information, that, that wheat and not the chaff, to our state and local partners as fast as possible. Uh, and there's something that we have in place that I'd love to talk to you more about called eGuardian, which is a system that's been in place for a while that we've significantly enhanced. And the key takeaway from that, Senator, is that it would dual route so simultaneously go straight from the call center, not just to the local field office, but also to the state fusion center or the equivalent. Uh, we've already had a number of instances, and I could go through a number of them here, where uh, some threat comes in and within hours, using that approach, within hours we've had an arrest. Uh, so I think we're very encouraged by the direction it takes, but make no mistake, this is one of the hardest things law enforcement has to deal with today, uh, and we're doing our best, and we're gonna keep working at it. So, so can you explain, so here, here's why I never get a response, okay? And first off, I don't think you have an easy job. I know it's hard, and you get lots of tips. I get all that. But I've never heard that, that's, and I don't get why somebody can't say a person was disciplined, they, you know, they were held accountable, something. I mean, like in, in, in you know, I'm a business guy, and in business, I mean, it's, it's the world. You have to hold people accountable if somebody made a mistake. I mean, if somebody said, you know, the person's name, I'm going to be a professional school shooter, that's pretty actionable, you'd think, right? And number two, when somebody calls just a few weeks before a school shooting and they give detailed information, I mean, you'd have to believe somebody got held accountable. And, and to this point, I mean, the Parkland families have, have never been told that anybody was held accountable. And it, it's always this amorphous, well, we can't, it's privacy or something like that. I mean, there has to be, there has to be better something, a better answer than that because it just seems that, you know, if you take the other side, you say, well, nothing happened then, you know, and it, it's, you know, that nobody got held accountable. Well, like I said, I'm, the, to me, the Privacy uh, Act issues and the pending litigation are things that I do have to take seriously uh, in responding to your question. I'm trying to lean, trying to lean in uh, in answering your question. I can tell you uh, that there were two individuals uh, principally involved with uh, the call. We've had one individual that's been reassigned as a, as a result of that um, inspection report, uh, and one who is, I guess the best way to put it, is no longer with the FBI. Uh, and I really can't go into more detail than that, but I would tell you uh, that the more important thing is it should not be anybody's impression, I can assure you, 
that nothing has been done. We've made massive changes out there, and, and I know we've invited you and your staff to come out and see it, and I would welcome that. I think you Great. would be encouraged by what you've seen out there. All right, thank you. Senator Carper. Let me just say uh, thank you all for your testimony. I thought you get uh, excellent testimonies, and uh, we appreciate that. Thank you for being here today and for the work that, uh, that you do. I passed uh, uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. Uh, he was leaving and as I was coming in. He's not on the committee, so he didn't get to ask questions. But he was going to ask, uh, if he could, if he would want to ask you about responding to QFRs, questions for the record, Mr. Ray. And uh, I would just ask you just to check with your team, just make sure that you're being responsive there, okay? Uh, that's the, he asked me to, to mention that, so I did on, and on his behalf. I know you probably get a lot of those. Um, I was privileged to uh, be the chairman of this committee a few years ago. Tom Coburn of Oklahoma was our ranking member, and it was uh, during the uh, Obama administration. And, and this, uh, we had a, a hearing or two and, uh, with folks uh, from uh, essentially from uh, Homeland Security and uh, Muscovy, and, and the, uh, the issue was uh, Swiss cheese. And you might say, well, why would it have been Swiss cheese? Because the, the leadership, uh, the top leadership uh, in uh, Homeland Security kind of looked like Swiss cheese. And we had uh, uh, a number of positions that were vacant in leadership positions. We had uh, many others that were filled by people in an acting capacity who'd never been uh, Senate confirmed. And when I, uh, we're happy that you're here and, and others that, that, are, that are filling in. But uh, uh, if he were here, he'd probably say, share the same concern, which is all these uh, people in acting, uh, acting positions. I, uh, I asked my staff to give me a number, and they said, upon the, 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 it's Coburn right now. He's, uh, he's everywhere. But uh, he, uh, I understand that uh, when uh, acting Secretary McLean uh, leaves, and I think he's been terrific, I, I hate to see him go, but uh, I understand that 11 of the 18 positions requiring Senate confirmation will be vacant. I'll say that again. 11 of the 18 positions requiring Senate confirmation will be vacant. And one of the reasons that uh, Tom Coburn and I worked hard along with the people on our committee uh, in those days was to, because the uh, Department of Homeland Security had the worst morale. Um, I mean, you know, it's measured about every two years, had the worst morale of, uh, of all the departments, major departments of government. And one of the reasons why was because of that. And uh, when, uh, the last uh, two years when uh, they, they uh, finished up and uh, that administration left, I remember talking to Jay Johnson, and he told me that the last uh, measurement, you know, we get this measurement every two years where they, some an independent entity uh, measures the morale of uh, the major departments, and the, the, the department that made the most improvement in that two-year period was Homeland Security. So it really uh, does, uh, does make a difference in more ways than we might expect. But I would ask each of you, and I'll just start, uh, start with you, David, can you speak uh, to how the lack of Senate confirmed leadership at the highest levels of DHS affects the interagency work that you all do to c keep our homeland secure? And, uh, and, and, and this would be just for you, uh, uh, Secretary Glowey. How can we in Congress push the President to nominate qualified individuals in order to ensure the Department is able to carry out its vital mission? Please. <coughs> Senator, thank you for bringing that up. And, uh, as 27 years in law enforcement and a career official through my entire starting as a Houston police officer, it's an honor and privilege to serve with the, the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security. They do an incredible mission. And the career service uh, members have carried on this uh, with an incredible uh, uh, professionalism. And I'm happy to say our employee viewpoint survey continues the upward trajectory, even though the, some of these uh, Senate confirmed positions are not filled. We continue our upward trajectory as well as my office had seen some of the biggest increases in morale this year and your staff will have access to that. Um, I would say that we have two, uh, two officials that are pending confirmation, our Undersecretary of Policy and our Chief Financial Officer. We would appreciate their, uh, their speedy confirmation. And as uh, one of the longest serving confirmed Senate confirmed official and una unanimously confirm me, I appreciate that by the Senate and this committee as well, sir. All right. Uh, uh, would it, either other would care to comment on this? Please. Uh, Senator, I would just say, uh, without speaking to DHS's uh, leadership vacancies, that we work very closely with the men and women of DHS across all their different uh, sub-agencies every day on our task forces. Uh, they're fantastic public servants and great partners, uh, and we're proud to stand with them. All right, thank you. Mr. And the same would be true of, of NCTC. I have many people embedded or at, at DHS, and I have many INA officers that work for me, and it's a very, very strong partnership. Good. 
I, I don't know if uh, I was out of the room for a little bit. I don't know if this has already been raised, but I want to talk a bit about our withdrawal of U.S. troops from uh, northeastern uh, San, uh, Syria. And uh, I, uh, something that troubles me deeply. Uh, I uh, gave a speech on the floor last, uh, I think it was last Thursday, uh, close of business, and um, I, uh, I mentioned that uh, something like 11,000 Kurdish lives had been lost in the, uh, the battle against uh, ISIS. And uh, compared to, I have a friend, you ask him how he's doing, he says, compared to what? And uh, 11,000 of their lives in, and uh, a relative handful uh, of ours. And uh, every one of those is dear and precious. But uh, I, uh, I just want to ask, and we'll start, let's see. I guess I'm going to ask what each of you do this. We'll start with you, Mr. Travers. But uh, can you uh, just uh, please speak about the effects that pulling out of U.S. troops from northeastern Syria will have on our Kurdish allies, please? Uh, I, I believe it's true that the um, uh, General Muslim and the Syrian Democratic Forces have been very close allies. Um, they have been incredibly important uh, in terms of providing intelligence over the years. Uh, um, we were heartened by both the, the President's and the Secretary of Defense's statement that the U.S. forces that will remain in Syria will have a continuing counterterrorism mission, um, as well as the, the oil and that there will be continued engagement with the SDF. Um, this remains a very important counterterrorism objective to us because they are, they are guarding many different prisons with um, both foreign fighter and Iraqi and Syrian ISIS fighters. And so um, that relationship really needs to continue. All right. And just a simple uh, yes or no, uh, were, were you all con consulted on this matter by the White House? Uh, I was not, but it wouldn't necessarily be the case that I would be. All right, thanks. Same, same question, if you could, uh, Mr. Ray. Could, could you just uh, talk a little bit about the effects that pulling out U.S. troops from northeastern Syria will have on our Kurdish allies? I think this is a little bit out of your wheelhouse, but take a shot. Um, well, parts of it are in our wheelhouse. Uh, in, in particular, uh, we're obviously concerned about um, potential uh, resurgence of ISIS if certain fighters in particular uh, were to escape or, or be released. Uh, we will say that the biggest threat to the homeland, uh, that is the biggest ISIS-related threat here in many ways, is the uh, online-inspired threat and, in effect, the virtual caliphate. So that threat is something that we've been all over, with or without, um, the, the presence in Syria. One of the things that we have done, we FBI, along with others, working with our partners, uh, anticipating the day where we might not be there, uh, is biometric enrollment over on the battlefield, in effect, in order to put us in a position where fingerprints, DNA, et cetera, are available and can be shared with our allies and others uh, so that in the event that fighters end up spreading out for one reason or another, we have a better chance of intercepting them before they do harm. All right, same, Mr. Quirt, same two, questions, two questions, if I could, and then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done. The same two questions, if you could, uh, Mr. Secretary. Were you consulted on this matter by the White House? Just a yes or no is, is fine. Sure, Senator, and uh, no, I was not, and I, I, I would not be in, in my current role. Um, but what I would say as a follow-on to what Director Ray said, uh, our partnership um, with obtaining the biometrics uh, from the ISIS fighters, al-Qaeda fighters, uh, any terrorist organization is critical for our vetting program. Um, and our relationships with the intelligence services, our law enforcement services abroad, our foreign partners. Um, but the disbursement of terrorism is global. Southeast Asia, Northwest, East Africa, Middle East are all threats from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Al-Shabaab, and others, and affiliates. Um, it's how we get that information and we vet them. So if the refugees or migration flows out of Yemen or Syria, are, are, are large, we have to have the biometrics to collect to make sure they don't come here, to run them against systems to make sure they're not terrorists, criminals, or foreign intelligence officers. So it's really critical that information sharing and that vetting process we have to make sure bad things or bad people aren't coming to the United States. Thanks so much, and thank you all for your service, your leadership, and the people you lead. Thank you. Senator Portman. Thanks to the three of you for some great testimony today, and most importantly for what you and the men and women who are in your organizations do every day to help keep us safe. Uh, I noticed. In your opening statement, uh, Director Ray, you talked about the Thousand Talents program. And uh, as you may know, uh, the Permanent Subcommittee Investigations uh, with Senator Carper and others were in the process of looking into that issue and have done a, a series of uh, hearings on related items, including on the Confucius Institutes. In fact, we did a Confucius Institute report that um, 
indicates that there are limitations that China places on the activities here, including censorship, uh, as an example, not allowing the academic community here to discuss topics they believe are politically sensitive, such as, you know, the Tiananmen Square uprising or something like that. Um, but as you say, it goes well beyond Confucius Institutes. Uh, you said that China is abusing the Thousand, thousand Talents program. I wrote, you also said that the FBI has about 1,000 cases, coincidentally, uh, investigating technology transfer. And you said that universities should be smarter about defending themselves. Um, I guess my question would be, um, what efforts have the FBI uh, taken to inform the higher education community about this threat? And what has your response been? Uh, so I think you've put your finger on an important issue. Uh, the role of academia in our country, especially given the amount of taxpayer-funded research there is in particular, uh, is a key component to this counterintelligence threat. So in addition to investigations, and I, I can't give you the number out of the thousand that involve uh, universities and in particular graduate students and researchers, uh, but certainly it's a significant number. But in addition to the investigations, we're much more actively engaged with major universities in encouraging them and informing them so that they can take appropriate action voluntarily uh, but robustly to guard against the threat. As far as the reaction we've gotten, uh, it varies. Uh, but I have been actually quite encouraged by quite a number of universities, which a few years ago would not have wanted to meet with the FBI under any circumstances, much less uh, in the kind of partnership way that's occurring now, including very good responsiveness from Ohio State. I've met with, uh, with them. Uh, and we had an academic summit in FBI headquarters just about a month ago where we brought in uh, chancellors and others from universities all across the country, a whole bunch of our SACs, uh, and kind of briefed them on some of the threats and had engagement about how we can work more uh, constructively together to help them defend themselves. Well, our information is that uh, Ohio State certainly and some other schools have expressed their um, uh, interest in working even more with you and appreciate what has been done uh, they also, I think, are not providing us the transparency we need to know whether there's a problem. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I probably let Ohio State speak for itself in terms of its own transparency. I'm but talking about uh, Ohio State. I'm talking about just in general. Uh, we found out, as you may know, in our uh, investigation, as an example, that about 70 percent of the schools were not properly reporting the foreign government payments that they were receiving with regard to the Confucius Institutes. So the transparency, although it's uh, some of it's in law already um, and, and not being followed is, is not adequate in our view. Is that your view? I, I think it's fair to say there's a lot of room for improvement, but we're seeing improvement. Okay. Uh, we talk about another issue that is a national security threat for our entire country, but for Ohio, uh, particularly hard hit, and that's the uh, drug crisis and the epidemic of overdoses and deaths. Um, we know that the southern border has lots of challenges. One is certainly the drug issue. We know that Crystal meth, uh, which is the, the new drug that is uh, causing havoc in our communities in Ohio, uh, but also heroin and cocaine comes almost exclusively across that southern border. And my question to you is really about what's happening. You see a significant reduction in terms of crossings. I'm looking at some data here uh, that compares last month to the month of May as an example. Almost a one-third reduction in crossings, or at least in apprehensions, which would indicate crossings. So the number of people coming over has slowed uh, considerably, still uh, a significant issue, but not like it was. And yet, from all the indications we have, the drug flow has not been reduced, even though many have linked uh, some of the same traffickers uh, who bring people across as bringing drugs across. Can you speak to that and talk about how these drugs are coming over? And uh, Assistant Secretary Glau, if you'd like to speak to that, that would be helpful. Um, uh, to, to this issue, but what what more can we do, of course, on the border, but also what is the relationship between people crossing and drugs crossing? Senator, thank you for the question. Um, just to give you the numbers from 2017 to 2019, so you know what we're dealing with on the narcotic flows. We've seen a 40 percent increase in cocaine from seizures at the uh, southwest border. We've seen a 20 percent increase in fentanyl. We've seen a 30 percent increase in heroin. And to your point, we've seen a 200 percent increase in methamphetamine. And that's in addition to um, the, uh, the emergency on the border we've had with the migrant flows and Border Patrol and Office of Air and Marine. 
and our Office of Field Operations being taken offline for just detention. So we have a crisis at the southwest border, and it's, and it's all based on moving people and goods illicitly across the border. Um, and that's what it's about. Cartels are about moving goods and people across the southwest so border. So with almost a third fewer people, have you seen any reduction in the drug flow? Because we certainly haven't experienced that no, from the other we, end. No, we've seen an increase. We've seen an increase, which and that's what we're apprehending. So those numbers are probably low. Um, that's what we're catching. It's what else is going in. So we've seen those increases in the last two years. Um, and the cartels are a sophisticated business about moving supplies in the United States. They're as good as any major business. There, there, there are profits in it. It ranges largely, but they're a Fortune 500 company. Um, and it's all about moving illicit goods across the border. And it's a sophisticated network of, uh, and I'm sure you've heard the names, of plaza bosses which, are run, which run and control what moves across the southwest border. And uh, they're trafficking supply chains and their relationships uh, with China, which is now, so the fentanyl production is moving into Mexico, um, is very sophisticated, very robust, and constantly changing and dynamic. Yeah, I'd love to follow up with you on that and maybe a QFR here on the fentanyl issue. My sense is there's not a lot of production of, methyl, of, of fentanyl in Mexico, but there is processing. Senator, words, they're, they're getting it just as we were getting it through the mail system, and still do, by the way. But they're getting it to Mexico, often converting it into a pill form and then sending it over. And, and again, a huge increase compared to even a few years ago, so a, a new threat on, on the border. But look, I, I, I think the demand side is key here. We've done a lot of work on that. We'll continue to on prevention, uh, recovery uh, programs, uh, treatment. But we've got to do something to deal with the flow, too, because this crystal meth, I will tell you, in the streets of Columbus, Ohio, I'm told, is less expensive than marijuana and deadly. And so um, we would appreciate any input you have as to how we can do a better job to reduce that supply at a minimum, not just reducing the poison coming into our communities, but reducing uh, the impact because it'll increase the cost. Uh, Senator, I, I just follow up. As, as far as actioning this, um, it's a sophisticated approach that goes just beyond law enforcement. It's, it's partnership with our U.S. intelligence community partners, our Mexican intelligence community partners, uh, the Mexican military, as well as our military. Um, and that partnership is robust, and we have a very good relationship with our, 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 our Mex Mexico partners. Uh, but it's really upping the game and a strategy to impact these groups um, that's going to have to go city by city, state by state. And as I mentioned to Chairman Johnson earlier, um, there are some areas that are primarily controlled by the cartels and that supply chain, and it's very sophisticated and will require um, a, a real strategic approach to how we're doing business. Senator Langford. Chairman, thank you. Let me first say to all of you, thank you for the work that you're doing. You don't hear that enough. Uh, there are a lot of threats, and uh, you face a lot of things, and you go through a lot of information each, each and every day uh, for the sake of our nation and for the people in my state in Oklahoma, and uh, we appreciate that very much. Uh, yesterday, we had a, an event in Oklahoma City uh, that we just called Day One. Uh, it was an event uh, that is 168 days away from the 25th anniversary of the Murrah Building bombing in 1995. 25 years ago, uh, we lost 168 Oklahomans, uh, many of them federal employees and their families, many of them children. And uh, we remember distinctly well what domestic terrorism looks like in Oklahoma City, and we have not forgotten about that. So for, from all of us and for the families and the people that I live around, uh, we want to say thank you uh, that you are staying vigilant in this. Um, because we do not take domestic terrorism lightly. So with that, let me, let me ask you to, uh, an unfair question. Uh, as you look at your time that you have to spend and the threats that you face right now, give me a percentage of threats that you face based on domestic terrorism and acts and international terrorism that are coming. Is that 60-40? Is it 50-50? Is it 70-30? And I know, again, it's an unfair question, but give me your best guess of what you're tracking right now. Are you, are you asking specifically about within the terrorism threats or within, about all within, threats within terrorism, large? Or? Within terrorism threats. Uh, I would think we are um, probably roughly, roughly half and half uh, international domestic on the terrorism front right now. Uh, certainly the number of arrests that we had in fiscal 19 was I think 107 domestic terrorism arrests, 121 international terrorism arrests. Uh, the investigations of domestic terrorism, probably about 900 right now, say, uh, about 1,000 HVEs, homegrown violent extremists. Now, we do have other 
uh, foreign terrorist organization investigations, so there's probably more investigations on the international terrorism side, but that gives you a little bit of a sense of it. Right, that helps. Uh, w when you identify the different types of uh, international terrorism threats that are coming into the United States or that have it, uh, a threat that you can identify coming towards the United States, is there a certain ideology that seems to be more typical for international foreign threats coming at the United States? Well, of course, we're, we're looking at both Sunni and Shia uh, threats, but I think in terms of the most immediate lethality, uh, it's the Sunni threats that are the ones that are more concerning. I'm sure Director Travers may have a few things to add to that, but I, I, you know, in particular, the ISIS-inspired attackers here. These are people who are not necessarily, didn't get up in the morning true believers, but kind of spend time online, radicalize, and essentially uh, have, have latched onto an ideology as an excuse to commit crude but very lethal attacks against often soft targets using easily, easily accessible weapons. That's probably the biggest threat to the homeland. Right. Senator, Senator Rosen and I have worked on an anti-Semitism task force uh, to continue to be able to bring up some of the issues of domestic terrorism uh, and threats, as uh, has been already named uh, the threat that was just uh, confronted this past weekend in Colorado uh, towards one of the synagogues there. Uh, there's a growing sense of ideology in multiple different areas, and uh, we're grateful that you're continuing to be able to engage foreign as well as domestic. Uh, let me shift topics just slightly on that because I want to get a feel for uh, where we were on that. Um, let me shift to election security. Uh, this has been an ongoing issue that Congress continues to be able to address. We've talked about multiple times with the Department of Homeland Security and their responsibility to be able to address election security. Uh, this Congress allocated $380 million in election security funding in 2018 uh, to states, but as the last time that I tracked those numbers, not even half of that money has been spent by the states yet. Do you have a, a, a good estimate at this point what the states have spent from the $380 million that Congress allocated to deal with election security, and how do you evaluate the status of preparation for election security right now? Uh, Senator, uh, as the head of intelligence, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on the state's allocation of, of those uh, resources that we've sent them, uh, so we'll take that for, for uh, our question for the record to come back with you. Um, regarding uh, the execution of what we're doing within the department, uh, you're very aware of the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency that's run by Director Chris Krebs has had an aggressive partnership with all 50 uh, state election officials and territories. Um, in the lead up to the 2018 election, we conducted over 1,400 field interviews um, and engagements directly with state officials. Um, just to give you an idea of our production as far as intelligence sharing directly with the states, classified and unclassified, in the lead up to the 2016 election, we did two, 24 intelligence reports. In the lead up to the 2018 election, uh, through my office, we did 313, and we're going to do quite a bit more as the lead up to the 2020. We're looking at attacks on the critical infrastructure of the election systems, but then also as Director Ray well, has mentioned as well, is we're really looking at that foreign influence campaign, that covert influence, how the use of social media, the amplifying effect to try to affect um, elections, but any range of things that that could be used at by threat actors at the state and local level, not just the federal level. Do you have what you need at this point to be able to help secure the elections? Um, Senator, I, I, I welcomed a, a discussion in going back with my colleagues in the department uh, to have an answer for that. Uh, but I can say from the department, we are, are aggressively posturing our resources in partnership with the FBI, in partner with all of the other U.S. intelligence community assets as well on specific collection requirements they have regarding what our vulnerabilities are. And then I would just like to highlight that we are in over 80 fusion centers, as uh, we mentioned earlier, is an information touch point, um, and I create the information sharing enterprise, the backbone of the technical infrastructure, which is the Homeland Security Information Network, um, which I have to uh, thank, and I know you're not appropriation, but you guys have funded and authorized us to use that, and that's been a fantastic information tool. Thank you. Dr Director Ray, I need to ask you a question that I don't need a specific answer for. We can get in a classified setting and go through greater depth on this. Uh, when American individuals travel to uh, Russia or China, there seems to be ample number of individuals to be able to track them and to be able to follow them and to be able to make sure that they're aware of all of their movements. Uh, I've yet to be able to talk to an American yet that's traveled to China or Russia and said, yeah, they ran out of people to be able to trail me. Do you have the resources that you need for individuals that you have suspicion on that are Chinese nationals or Russian nationals currently in the United States? to be able to make sure that we have coverage at the level that is needed for individuals that there's high suspicion. I can tell you that our counterintelligence program is a, uh, an area where we are in need of growth and resources, not just agents and analysts, but linguists. 
uh, and we need more data analytics. All of these uh, issues, including on the one that you're mentioning, uh, in today's world involve terabytes and terabytes of data. And in order to be able to be agile to exploit that quickly and effective, we need to have the right tools to be able to get through that information. Um, and so we have, I know the, the President's budget request, uh, you know, has uh, uh, requests in that category, but I can assure you that that's the kind of thing that would be put to great use uh, quickly. That's great. Thank you. Senator Romney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, one thing I've noted in each of the uh, questions that have been answered so far is the questioners have begun by uh, expressing appreciation to your uh, respective agents for the work that they do. I, I, I think I, I certainly speak for myself, and I believe I speak for all the members of the Senate that I've spoken with, uh, and it probably includes almost all, which is there is a very profound appreciation for the, the sacrifice and the extraordinary professionalism of the men and women who serve in your respective agencies, and I hope that that is um, uh, expressed to your, your members time and time again. Uh, uh, Mr. Glaway, uh, you spoke about four nations in particular that try and uh, interfere with uh, our, our sense of unity in the country, our political process, our elections, uh, Russia, China, North Korea, um, and, and Iran. Uh, can you, can any one of you give me a, a uh, if you will, kind of a rough sense of, uh, is, this, is this an ad hoc process that goes on within their country, or is it organized by their governments and staffed by a certain number of people with a budget associated with it? And if it is organized, do we have a sense of the scale of the enterprise that's undertaken by, by these, each of these countries to interfere with our election process, to sow disunity through social media and the like? Well, I, I think there might be more that we could say, you know, in classified setting on that. But what I, I would say is that uh, all of those countries have uh, designs uh, in engaging in malign foreign influence in this country. Of them, uh, the Russians are the ones who have most uh, advanced this idea of sowing divisiveness and discord, the pervasive messaging campaigns, uh, false personas, things like that. But certainly, Iran, we know, is taking very careful note of what the Russians have done and has its own malign foreign influence efforts, uh, some of which have a cyber dimension to them. Uh, and it's something we're tracking very carefully. And of course, the Chinese, that's a whole nother uh, kettle of fish, as it were. Uh, and they have a very robust foreign influence effort here, but it's a different, uh, they all have their own uh, shapes and sizes to the problem. But it's highly organized by each of their respective governments. It's not just something that's done uh, on an ad hoc basis. I think that's a fair statement. Yeah. yeah. Um, as you spoke, uh, uh, Director Ray, about the, uh, the incursions on an hourly basis of, of Chinese in particular, but as well as other countries, into our corporate databases, our government databases, and so forth, um, I thought about how impossible the task must be to try and protect all the places people can attack. And, and I was reminded of the uh, mutual assured destruction uh, orientation that was, was part of our uh, national security with regards to nuclear weapons. Uh, should we have a, a mutually assured disruption effort of some kind, which is to say, um, uh, is the only way to prevent the number of attacks and the severity of attacks that we're seeing a, a, an indication that we can do the same thing to them, uh, only we can do it harder and bigger and more destructively, such that they say, okay, we better stop or we're going we're gonna to suffer as well? Well, I don't know if I would say that's the only way. I think offensive cyber operations are an important part of any nation's uh, cyber strategy, and it is ours. Uh, we are uh, working much more closely with the private sector than ever before uh, in terms of trying to help them defend themselves and our relationships with the uh, with businesses ranging from small startups all the way to Fortune 100 companies are much more robust uh, than I would when I was in this world when I was at DOJ, you know, many years ago. Um, and in many ways, today's cyber threat is less about uh, and cyber security is less about preventing the intrusion in the first place, although that's obviously the goal, and more about detection as quickly as possible and mitigation as quickly as possible once you find it. Think of the example, it's, it's great to put locks all around the outside of your house and cameras and lights and everything else, but if the guy's already managed to pay off somebody to get inside your basement and he's just hanging out there, 
all the stuff on the outside isn't going to do a whole lot. So a lot of the efforts today working together with DHS and others are trying to get organizations to be able to quickly find the threat, quickly tie it off, and prevent the damage from getting worse. And, and just one question, and perhaps for any one of you or all three of you, and that relates to cryptocurrency. I'm not on the banking committee. Uh, I don't begin to understand how cryptocurrency works. Uh, I would think it is more difficult to carry out your, your work uh, when, when we can't follow the money because the money is, uh, is hidden from us. Uh, and, and wonder whether there should not be some kind of effort taken in our nation to deal with cryptocurrency and the, the uh, challenges that that prevents for law enforcement and for uh, d deterrence of, of terrorist activity. Am I, am I wrong in thinking this is an area we ought to take a look at, or, or is cryptocurrency just not a big deal as, as it relates to your respective responsibilities? Well, certainly uh, for us, cryptocurrency is already a significant issue, and we can project out pretty easily that it's going to become a bigger and bigger one. Uh, whether or not that is the subject of uh, appropriate subject of some kind of regulation as the response is harder for me to speak to. Uh, we're looking at it from an investigative perspective, including tools that we have to try to uh, follow the money, even in this new world that we're living in. Uh, but it is part of a broader trend, and Director Travers alluded to it uh, in terms of the terrorist threat, in terms of our adversaries of all shapes and sizes uh, becoming more facile with technology, and in particular, various types of technology that anonymize their efforts, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's default encryption on devices and messaging platforms. Uh, we are moving as a country and as a world in a direction where if we don't get our act together, money, people, communications, evidence, facts, all the bread and butter for all of us to do our work will be essentially walled off from the men and women we represent. Thank you. I, I, I would just close, Mr. Chairman, in, in just uh, acknowledging that the President today uh, spoke of the, uh, the, the tragedy which occurred in Mexico where uh, uh, apparently three women and, and six children were, were brutally murdered uh, and has offered our, our national support to help the Mexicans get to the bottom of this and, uh, and appreciate the fact that you're uh, willing to participate in that at the direction of the President and hope we will uh, find a way to uh, bring people to justice who deserve to be brought to justice and also uh, prevent events like this from happening in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Romney. Uh, Senator Hawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director Ray, a, a question on the cybersecurity topic, if I could, um, and as it relates to China in particular. Are you concerned about the uh, growing practice of American technology companies, or any American companies for that matter, storing large amounts of data, consumer data, uh, business data uh, in China, and uh, sometimes storing the encryption keys to that data in China? I mean, does this, does this, but what sort of a cybersecurity risk does this pose? Is this something you're tracking that you're concerned about? Uh, it is something that we're concerned about, uh, in part because Chinese laws require a level of access um, that is unparalleled, certainly, in this country, uh, in terms of law enforcement and security services. Uh, Chinese law essentially compels Chinese companies and typically compels U.S. companies that are, are operating in China to have relationships with different kinds of Chinese companies um, to provide whatever information the government wants, whenever it wants, essentially just for asking. Um, and so that creates all kinds of risks, uh, you know, across the various threats that we have to contend with. And that, your point there about the, the Chinese laws and the access to data that Beijing requires sort of works in, in two ways, doesn't it? I mean, it, it, is a, it is a problem for American companies who choose to store large amounts of data in China because to do so they have to partner under Chinese laws with, with some sort of Chinese counterpart that often has ties to the government, right? That's number one. But number two, it's also a security risk from the point of view of Chinese-based companies who have access to our market, who do business here, gather large amounts of information on American consumers like TikTok, for instance, but actually are, are owned or based in China and therefore are subject to those, those same Chinese laws on, uh, on data and data sharing. Is that, is that fair to say? Uh, that's absolutely something that we're concerned about. Uh, even you start with the, the proposition that a astonishing percentage of Chinese companies are in fact state-owned enterprises, 
but even the ones that are not technically state-owned enterprises, the ones that are ostensibly private, are subject both to the Chinese laws that I referred to a minute ago, as well as, and I think a lot of people just kind of gloss right over this, any Chinese company of any appreciable size has, by Chinese law, embedded in them Chinese Communist Party cells, or committees as they're called, whose sole function is to ensure that that company stays in lockstep with the Chinese Communist Party's policies. Can you imagine something like that happening with American companies and American policy? I mean, it, it, it's something that people need to take very seriously. Yeah, absolutely, and thank you for your, your work on this. I think, as you point out, I think American consumers don't realize the threat to, to their own data security and privacy uh, when American companies choose to, to store that data in China and thereby open up uh, potentially that data to use by the Chinese government, or they don't realize that Chinese-based companies who are doing business in this country are subject to those same laws, and so it, it, it works It works both ways. Um, switching gears, uh, Secretary Glauwe, let me ask you about the border. Uh, Senator Portman was talking about the influx of, of meth and the serious effects it has in Ohio. I can tell you in the state of Missouri, we are absolutely overwhelmed with meth coming across from the border. I mean, there is not a community in my state, urban, rural, north, south, east, west, that is not just awash in, in meth. You pointed out that uh, between, I think it was 2017 and 2019, that uh, the southern border apprehensions up over 200% for meth. Um, I just wanted to, to, to drill down on a few additional details here and, and to get to to get your input. Did I hear you to say to Senator Portman that the meth apprehensions, other drug apprehensions, have continued to increase even as border apprehensions of illegal individuals has decreased? Is that is that right? That is correct. And, and, and again, this is a two-year snapshot. So it was cocaine 40 percent, fentanyl 20 percent, heroin 30 percent, and methamphetamine 200 percent. And that's at the border. Um, that's at the border is where we're seizing that. That's in addition to the migration um, challenges we've had, but just by officers taking offline with the detention processing, we're still seeing the numbers up. And is that, do you have any sense in the last few months, I know that we've seen a decline in the last few months of border apprehensions of individuals, but it, it, do you have a sense or do you know what the uh, numbers for um, contraband look like? Uh, Senator, we could, we could get back for a, uh, as a QFR on that, but what I would say, and I said this earlier, is uh, the business model for the cartels is to move illicit goods and people across the border to get them there and to move them. And that grows through a very sophisticated network inside the, inside the, the country of Mexico and south of Mexico, as well as, as, as a, a management structure called plaza bosses that occupy the entire southwest border. Um, they control what goes across and what does not go across, and it's all based on money of moving people and goods. Let me ask you this. You uh, talked about fentanyl production moving, at least to some degree, to Mexico, so from China to Mexico, although it sounds like maybe in partnership with uh, Chinese outlets. Can you say something more about that? Um, what I would say is that we, we, we may want to have take this in a, in a classified setting, but we have seen that the fentanyl production and trafficking, as, as we would anticipate, the cartels own the supply chain in the United States and the trafficking routes getting in here. Um, that that fentanyl production and trafficking would begin to move into Mexico, and we are seeing that. Hmm. Um, finally, let me ask you this. You said that uh, in order to address this, this crisis, the drug crisis, and the flow of drugs over the border, it would require a change in our whole strategic approach. Can you say more about what you have in mind and, and what you think needs to change, maybe what this committee and this body would do to give you the tools that you need? Well, I, I would say is I, I'd welcome a conversation that would probably expand upon my partners here at this table. Um, but in my prior capacity as, as a unique witness, I was the Deputy National Intelligence Manager for Transnational Organized Crime when I was at the ODNI. And when I say that is the strategic approach, what I mean is bringing law enforcement, U.S. intelligence community, Mexican intelligence community, and military assets to bear um, in Mexico in some of these lawless areas where the cartels are essentially running the area. Um, but that also has to be hand in glove. Uh, with our demand. The U.S. Uh, has a high demand for narcotics, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a joint process, and it, it's in that realm of having that partnership with our, our Mexican counterparts uh, in that space um, to identify the bad and fill it with the good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Holliday. Before I turn to Senator Peters, just a quick follow-up, because uh, I think you, we need to underscore this. So, although our border is rather unsecure on our side, would you agree with this statement that on the Mexican side of the border, it's 
pretty secure. There's not much that passes through the Mexican side of the border without uh, Mexico, uh, the cartels and human traffickers knowing about it, correct? Uh, the plaza bosses and the cartels um, run the south side of the border on the Mexico side. Uh, does the Mexican military and law enforcement have the capability? They do. But we, right then, it's going to require a strategic approach of how those resources are deployed in partnership with us. But the cartels are incredibly powerful. We also have to bear in mind there's a corruption angle that plays into this as well. So where there's a, a will and a, where there's a will to secure a border, there's a way, and Mexican cartels prove it on the southern side. Uh, uh, Chairman Johnson, you, you, you're, uh, I think your assessment there is correct, uh, but there are models out there. We've been successful. Columbia is an, as a model of success we had uh, in partnership with that government years ago. Senator Peters. Hey, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just want to uh, follow up on uh, what, I, what I, I hope is the priority for, for all three of you, and that's to combat foreign influence um, you know, in our elections. Uh, uh, Director Ray, my question to you, and, and I think it's, it's accurate, that's a priority for you, is yes or no? Absolutely. Uh, what direction, if any, have you received from the White House about the priority of foreign influence uh, in our elections? I think it's been made crystal clear to us that it is a priority for us to combat malign foreign influence from any nation state, including Russia, including China, including Iran, uh, and others. Yeah. How has that been communicated to you by the White House? Well, I mean, we've had numerous uh, meetings uh, over at the White House uh, with the NSC and with others uh, on, on election security issues. Um, and. And so it's been sort of a recurring theme in those meetings. Is the White House doing anything to coordinate uh, with other security agencies? Are they pulling folks together in a coordinated fashion, in your estimation? And if you could uh, explain how that's happening? Well, I mean, certainly we've had, uh, as I said, we've had NSC meetings and NSC-driven coordination over the time that I've been uh, director. Uh, but in particular, uh, the way it works right now is that with the NSC's direction and the White House's direction, ODNI uh, brings together a smaller group as opposed to the more sprawling NSC apparatus. Uh, in particular, it's us, FBI, ODNI, DHS, and NSA are the sort of the key players and then others from time to time uh, as, as need uh, arises. And there's all kinds of engagement between, for example, our Foreign Influence Task Force, which I stood up after becoming director, uh, the Russia Small Group at NSA that uh, General Nakasone stood up, and there's a you know, similar type of body at DHS and so on at ODNI, and there's a, uh, a woman at ODNI, very, uh, uh, very experienced, very seasoned, who uh, then Director Coates put, and she has remained in charge of kind of coordinating the efforts kind of on a more day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I uh, continue to hear from my constituents in Michigan about uh, very lengthy and intrusive screenings uh, every time uh, they travel, uh, Secretary Glowey. Uh, they describe it as a backdoor travel ban uh, that discourages them from traveling, and it hurts uh, their business uh, and their families, uh, and certainly maintaining uh, safe and secure air travel while protecting civil rights of law-abiding travelers is a, is a balance we may have to achieve, as we talked about earlier. You have a lot of balances that you have to do in your agency. But my question to you is the department has indicated to my staff that they will now lead a comprehensive review of secondary screenings in fiscal year 2020 with input from other relevant federal partners. Could you describe how you would envision that process and how you would expect those recommendations to come out? Uh Ranking Member Peters, I'd have to take that question for the record to go back to U.S. Customs and Border Protection. It sounds like who would be leading that because they're, they're the ones that do the secondary inspections. Um, but what I can say uh, is coming from that organization is we are always cognizant of the civil rights and civil liberties of U.S. citizens, foreign citizens that are traveling to the United States. And the protocols and the oversight with that has, has been very rigorous. But I'll take that for the record and come back for an answer with you. You could do that um, uh, in a quick manner. I would appreciate it. Uh, I, the vast majority of constituents that I've also hear from are, are, are very uh, d deeply dissatisfied with the DHS uh, trip, which is, as you know, the redress uh, process for travelers who experience uh, screening uh, difficulties. Uh, are there ways to expand and strengthen trip so that applicants don't feel ignored? And do you have some specific recommendations how we can make this process more efficient? Uh, again, similar to my prior answers, being the head of intelligence, I'll have to take that back for the record and have an answer for you on that. We'd hope uh, we could get that answer uh, quickly. I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Senator Sinema. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate our witnesses being here today. As a senator from a border state, I know it's critical that we work together to tackle threats against the homeland and along our nation's borders. And I remain committed to working every day to secure Arizona's border, keep Arizona safe, and ensure that migrants are treated fairly and humanely. I'd like to start with the tragedy that occurred on Monday in Sonora, Mexico. My deepest sympathies and condolences go to the victims and their families. Details are still coming in, but we know that at least nine people, including mothers and their young children, were murdered, apparently by transnational criminal organizations involved in the illicit drug trade. These victims have relatives from Arizona, and my state is hurting right now. So my first question is for you, Mr. Ray. In this situation, will the FBI play a role in bringing these perpetrators to justice, ensuring that the families receive some redress? Uh, so thank you, Senator. We, too, are uh, deeply troubled uh, and uh, heartbroken about the loss. We have, through our LEGAT office in Mexico, reached out to our partners, uh, our Mexican partners, uh, to offer assistance uh, and are engaged with them also with the embassy uh, and the State Department. In addition, uh, we are uh, in the process of having what we call our Victim Services Division uh, get in touch with the relatives who are here in the United States to see if they can be of assistance. Uh, it's a division that uh, I think I'm very proud of, just given the way in which they bring a level of compassion uh, and sometimes attention to some of the most basic concerns and needs uh, of victims and their families. Thank you. Um, for all of our witnesses who are here today, I'd like to get a commitment from each of you that my office is briefed on the investigation and I'd like to hear about your agency's efforts to combat transnational criminal organizations. As we see every day, the impact on Arizona and Arizona families is unabated. The FBI is, is the lead, obviously, with the U.S. persons being targeted by that violence overseas. Uh, what I would say is we are absolutely committed to partnering with you, Senator. And I would say as, as far as the benchmark of intelligence and operations, uh, one of our, our top facilities is actually in your state, in Tucson. And I would uh, be uh, delighted if I could escort you there for a visit to, to see it. Um, but it's really about that partnership with the state and local law enforcement and our Mexican partners and sharing of that real-time tactical level information so we can uh, identify those threats at the border, but really any, any, any way south of the border in Mexico and sharing that information with our partners in the Mexican government. Thank you. Uh, Senator, we'd be happy to try to keep you informed as best we can and, uh, and as is appropriate. Uh, I will underscore that, of course, uh, what role the FBI will be able to play uh, in Mexico depends a lot on the willingness of our Mexican partners to uh, embrace and bring us in, and that's still something that's being worked out. It's a very fluid situation right now. So I don't, as we sit here right now, yet know exactly what our footprint, if you will, will look like, but we'd be happy to, to follow back up with you as things progress. Thank you. And the National Counterterrorism Center doesn't actually work that particular issue. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you a question, uh, Mr. Glauber. I spoke a few times with Secretary McAleen about the need to improve information sharing between DHS and HHS regarding allegations of abuse that were reported by migrants who'd been held at the Yuma Border Patrol Station, I'm sure you recall. Can you share the status of DHS efforts to ensure these types of incidents are reported more quickly and that swift action is taken when there are reports that require more protection of migrants and children? Uh, so, Senator, as my role as the head of intelligence, I, I don't have a status update on that, but I'll take that for the, the record and have an answer for you back. Um, but I will say, as a career law enforcement official, uh, as well as a federal law enforcement official, um, that the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security uh, operate at the most highest standards. And when there is an incident that has to be reported to the inspector general or to the FBI, that that's handled quickly um, and uh, mitigated as, as fast as possible within the department. Thank you. Uh, back in September, this committee held a hearing with outside experts on domestic terrorism. At that hearing, I spoke about the importance of information sharing and ensuring that our state and local law enforcement entities can access the information they need. Such information sharing is always easier for larger police departments, such as those in Phoenix or Tucson, but is more challenging for our rural sheriffs. With regard to information sharing between federal, state, and local law enforcement entities, what steps have your agencies taken in the past year to ensure that small or rural law enforcement entities 
are able to get better access to information about threats and trends, and what do these agencies still need to improve on? So uh, I'll start and then turn it over to Undersecretary Glowey. Um, on our end, uh, we, our principal engagement from a day-to-day -day basis with our state local partners, which includes some very small uh, departments, uh, is through our Joint Terrorism Task Forces, and we have 200 of them all over the country, uh, and we have task force officers, which are essentially state and local officers from, in many cases, including some of those small departments, who work full or, in some cases, part-time on our task forces, which gives them access to all the same information that all the FBI folks and federal partners on the task forces have. That's probably the most significant uh, means. Uh, in addition, uh, we jointly with DHS on a number of instances will put out bulletins uh, of different sorts. Uh, they're pretty frequent that provide information in a fairly granular way about what we're seeing in terms of threats and so forth. Um, and so those are some of the big ones that I'd highlight. Um, and I'll maybe let David chime in. Uh, yes, just to follow on that. So a couple of the big infrastructure, and I'll talk about very specifics with uh, Arizona and the Southwest border. So uh, my office hosts the Homeland Security Information Network, Intel. So we host the products for the FBI, for the Department of Homeland Security, and our state and local partners, and the private sector. There's currently 42,000 products on it. In fiscal year 2017, we had about 17 or so thousand views. I'm happy to report in 2019, after a very aggressive rollout with this, we had over 90,000 views on this. We hosted over 11,500 products. This is an unclassified network that's available in all fusion centers as well as satellite locations and a login capability. Regarding the southwest border, because you're right, we have a, a limited capacity and they need intelligence officers to give them tactical level information, unclassified information and classified. Um, I did a pilot program starting in, I believe it was in June and May. I put 19 DHS intelligence officers on the southwest border to include Arizona. That resulted in 45 drug seizures, 45 drug related arrests, 35 seizures of weapons and drugs, and 150 intelligence reports. I'm going to permanently deploy, I think, right around 10 intelligence officers permanently to the southwest border in the very small sheriffs and municipal law enforcement departments to uh, enable them to do an enterprise approach and scale capabilities to share information. Thank you. Um, a follow-up question for both of you. Um, last year, Congress passed and the President signed to law the Preventing Emerging Threats Act, which grants authorities to DHS and the DOJ to counter threats from unmanned aircraft systems. During my visits to the border, I've seen evidence of the threats these drones can pose. I've actually watched drones come over the border um, in broad daylight. So could you tell us about what DHS and DOJ um, are doing to mitigate the dangers to our nation from these unaccompanied aircraft system threats? Uh, so, Senator, thank you for the question. And I was ranking, I'm sorry, I was Chairman Johnson's, um, one of his lead witnesses in the lead up to passing that legislation that he championed. So I can speak specifically, and I was also in the southwest border um, and uh, did a report for that for one of the news networks. Um, so this is, a, this is a threat that continues to be a threat. Um, we track that the Department of Homeland Security, not just on the southwest border, but on drone incursions over critical infrastructure. And we're seeing a percentage increase that just keeps increasing. Um, and in, in engagement with our state and local and private sector, I was just out with uh, the Los Angeles Police Department Chief and the New York P Police Department Commissioner on drones, where the drone legislation was an outstanding first step. It is, they are saying now that they need more, um, uh, more capabilities um, and more, uh, more within their own authorities to mitigate these threats. But the southwest border is just one of many from the drone threats that threatens our critical infrastructure, our mass gatherings, and the ways to move illicit goods over the border, as well as use it as a counter-surveillance platform to, uh, to, to uh, suck up information from our, from our military or our law enforcement or our private institutions in the country. I would just add that uh, while we're extremely grateful to the chairman and others for that legislation, uh, this is a threat that uh, is overtaking us in many ways. Uh, we are currently investigating a, a number of incidents in the U.S. of attempts to weaponize uh, drones in one way or another. Certainly we've been seeing them, as you mentioned, uh, down on the border. We've also seen drones used to deliver contraband you know, into prisons. And of course, uh, as, as the rest of the committee knows as well, there have been efforts to use drones quite frequently on the battlefield uh, against our, our forces and our allies overseas. Uh, our focus from the FBI end has been principally on the mass gathering situation, so we're very focused on things like the Super Bowl, et cetera, not because the others aren't incredibly important, but just in the realm of being able to prioritize the use of these new authorities 
that's, that's at the moment where we are. We're, there's going to be a need for more technological solutions, uh, disrupting drones over large, crowded civilian areas is a different kind of exercise than doing it in the battlefield. Uh, and we're working very closely with our partners, DHS, Department of Transportation, DOD, and obviously DOJ uh, on that. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I've exceeded my time. Thank you for your yep, indulgence. Yes, you have. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> well, thanks, Senator Sinmick. But you used it well because you actually, actually asked a question I was going to ask about drones. Oh, see? But, but let it's me, let not me quick... actually my time. It's fine. doesn't even count. So, so let, let me quick follow <laughs> up on that, though. We always felt that piece of legislation was just a first step. You know, begin those authorities so you could be, begin doing the research and develop the strategies for doing something very difficult to do. So the question I have, how far have we come in terms of doing that research, developing those strategies, and do you already need more authority? Do you, do you need another piece of legislation if you come far enough where we need to go to the second step? Well, I don't think, I don't think I'm quite ready in this kind of setting to uh, propose uh, some kind of additional legislation but what I would say uh, is that I think there is a, if, I, if memory serves, there's a report that we are scheduled to be providing to you all on exactly the question you're raising uh, to address the need for, you know, identifying other gaps that might exist. Uh, and I do know that from traveling around the country and meeting with state and local law enforcement, uh, that while they're very excited that federal authorities now have this uh, civilian use capability, they want to know when they can get they're, it. They're still lacking. So, right. so, so you're not ready to say, I mean, I'll ask you know, Under Secretary Glauwe the same thing. You may not be ready right now to propose a piece of legislation, but you're basically saying sometime in the future you'll need some more authority. I mean, if not federal government, also local officials. Yeah, just to follow what Director Ray said is, um, in our sense, science and technology bank is, is partnering with the FBI down at Quantico on the countermeasures and how we're supporting national security special events on identifying and mitigating those threats. But the threat is bigger than those national security special events. Um, what I would say is we monitor from the analyst side of the emerging technologies. We have radio controlled drones. We're now moving into 4G, which will have 5G capabilities. What is that going to look like? Is the legislation kept, kept keeping up with that capability of the emerging technology. I think that's a question to come back and have that discussion. Um, but as this technology advances so rapidly for commerce purposes, the nefarious aspects of it or just from a safety aspect, I think there's a conversation to be had on, on how much, how we have to really stay on top of the legislation on this. Well, again, we'll have to cooperate. That report will be important. The, by the way, probably the main reason we were able to pass that piece of legislation is because we had the video of, I believe is ISIS using this in Iraq and you can see the drone go over the target lower, drop, bomb, boom, pinpoint accuracy, and that, that, that got everybody's attention. It still took us a little while. We, we weren't able to put it to the NDAA. We finally got the FAA reauthorization bill, but uh, um, that cooperation is going to be important. Uh, Director Travers, you, you addressed a little bit the situation of ISIS prisoners. I, I want to drill down a little bit deeper. Um, first of all, have our European partners, have they started stepping up the plate and gotten a little more serious about and again, I realize, because I talk to them all the time, it's very difficult. They don't necessarily have laws to handle this. But are they considering the return of foreign fighters and prosecuting under their own laws so that they're just not looking to somebody else to detain these people forever? Uh, you're quite right that the uh, issue of repatriation has been a problem for years um, uh, because of the inability to either prosecute because of lack of, of evidence or uh, short sentences. They've not been willing to bring prisoners back. Uh, they've been somewhat more willing to bring women and children back, but even that's been a bit of an issue. Um, ever since uh, over two, three weeks ago when the incursion started, there's been a flurry of activity, I think, within European capitals about trying to bring their women and children home, in particular, out of some of the IDP camps, um, out of humanitarian interests. We have not seen any um, increased level of willingness to bring their foreign fighters back. In fact, there's been some um, uh, getting rid of citizenship just so that they, they can kind of wait their hands of it. In terms of uh, responsibility sharing, uh, duty sharing, I've heard the proposal that maybe the Arab states could go into the you know, camps with women and children, go through a sorting process to a certain extent. You know, you know, which, which of those detained individuals can potentially be uh, rehabilitated, brought back in society versus those that need to, to be considered for longer term detention? Are you hearing efforts or any kind of uh, uh, um, initiatives occurring along those lines? I think 
frankly, right now, because there's so much turmoil and uncertainty geopolitically about who's going to control these things, that um, the likelihood of that is probably going down. There has certainly been some willingness on the part of the Iraqis in particular to bring back uh, IDPs out of El Hal and so forth. There's 30, 40,000 people there. Um, but in general, it's a, it's a pretty difficult proposition to even know where these people are as they get moved around. So give me your general assessment of all the players. And we've got Turkey and, and you know, we have the, the, the SDF and we have Assad and we have Russia, we have Iran. Obviously we have you know, our, our desire to make sure that ISIS can't reconstitute. Is there pretty much a universal desire not to allow ISIS to reconstitute, or is there a little, little bit less uh, commitment on some of the part, part you know, some of those uh, players? Well, I, you know, there, there's no one that wants ISIS to, to reconstitute. I think it's fair to say that the Turks, for instance, are more concerned about PKK than they are against ISIS. Um, I don't think anyone uh, has as much concern as perhaps we do in the area about, about ISIS. Um, but in general, uh, for instance, uh, my guess is there's going to be an effort to keep those prisoners in prison, whomever you know, gets control of the prisons uh, if, if the Turks move any further south. Okay, my final question is for honestly all of you that want to contribute to this, but the blue study, the blue ribbon study panel uh, that we had testimony from a couple of years ago, uh, their, their primary conclusion was we need somebody in charge. I think their recommendation was put the vice president's office, and back then Vice President Biden, uh, pretty close to the end of their term, said you know, every administration would be somewhat different. But we, we, heard, we had, had the same issue when we were discussing 5G in our, in our hearing uh, just last week, I think we found out that it's the National Economic Council and, and Larry Kudlow is kind of in charge of, of the 5G aspect of, of cyber. But if you go all the way down the list, uh, whether it's you know, a catastrophic EMP GMD attack, a cyber attack shutting down our electrical grid or financial system, you know, some kind of w, WMD chemical or biological attack, uh, you know, natural disaster, I think we pretty well assume FEMA is going to take charge of that. You know, starting with local, then state, and then FEMA comes in when it overwhelms uh, the state and local governments. In the other instances, is there a sense within your agencies that you know exactly who's going to be stepping up the plate in terms of recovery and response to one of these potential catast catastrophic threats? I'll start with you, uh, you know, Undersecretary Glaway. Uh, I, I, from the department, it's, it's very well defined. I mean, the Federal Emergency Management Administration is there, uh, as well as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Director Chris Krebs uh, in that position. So within the department, it's clear, and the lines from the intelligence from the vulnerability side is clearly mine, and the collection requirements going to the U.S. Intelligence Committee and foreign partners flows through me. So I, I say within the department, um, I'm very comfortable to say the lines of effort are, are what, what about, But again, that's within the department. What, is there going to be turf battles? Is, is everybody going to be looking at and pointing fingers at somebody else in terms of who has the overall responsibility, who's in charge? I mean, from FEMA's standpoint, I think that's very clear, is their, their response capability. Um, and and within, the, within the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, I think that's, that's very clear. Um, and from the intelligence apparatus, as Director Ray had mentioned, we have a, a national intelligence manager for cyber that aligns our intelligence capability at the ODNI. Director Ray, obviously FBI frequently is first on the spot in some of these mass shootings, whatever. What, what, what about a catastrophic type of attack on infrastructure. Do, do, you, do you have a sense, of, do you know exactly you know, what the line of authority is, you know, obviously starting with the president, but I mean at an operational level within these departments and agencies? You know, I, I will say, I'll take the two categories in turn. There's the terrorist category, if you will, uh, and then there's the cyber category. And I think you're asking about both, or? Yeah, so I mean, yeah. I'm just talking about right. no matter what might shut down an electrical grid or shut down our financial, you know, whatever could really represent almost an existential threat to this nation or, so, or be so catastrophic in terms of power outage or, or whatever? Well, I, I think what I would say on the, on the terrorist attack category, for example, uh, I have actually, as somebody who was in the FBI headquarters building on 9-11 and intimately involved in these issues during the years uh, after 9-11, and then having now come back to this world with some time in the private sector in between, I can tell you that the machine that exists now across the U.S. government with our partners at state and local level through the Joint Terrorism Task Forces, et cetera, 
is so much more mature and robust and kind of a well-oiled machine in terms of everybody working together that it was one of the most pleasant surprises uh, I found in coming back. So I, I think the lanes in the road and the way in which everybody works together is pretty well defined in the terror space. In the cyber arena, likewise, although it's slightly different lanes, uh, as I said in response to one of your colleagues' earlier questions, uh, in a major cyber incident, the FBI is in charge of investigating the threat, but DHS has got to be joined at the hip in terms of making sure that uh, appropriate steps are taken to protect the asset, uh, and there are well-defined lanes there. I think there is a temptation sometimes to assume that one person needs to be responsible for all those things. I think really the premium is on coordination. Um, and at some level, given the unique nature of the authorities that are involved in whether it's a terrorist incident or a cyber incident, you start talking about law enforcement authorities that are constitutionally entrusted to the Attorney General. Uh, you have uh, military responsibilities, offensive cyber, for example, that are in the lane of DOD. And I think it, it uh, while it might sound nice to try to create some new person who would be in charge of all that, I think, in fact, it would be more complicated uh, and actually would not accomplish what was designed. So the key is to make sure everybody's got their lanes and their responsibilities well-defined and the partnership, and that's what I think I'm seeing uh, day to day. Okay, so, so not to put you at odds with the blue ribbon study panel, which you're, you're, you're a little less concerned about that. You really do, what you're seeing now, you're seeing a fair amount of coordination and you don't lose a whole lot. You may lose sleep over the threat, but you don't lose sleep over the fact that It'd just be chaos that uh, nobody would know who's in charge or we wouldn't know how to, to coordinate, cooperate within the agencies. There, there's always room for improvement, but and, and that's important. I don't want to be understood as thinking everything's just honky-dory, but, uh, but we are, I think, in a so much better place as a country and as a government, and I'd say that across government, federal, state, and local, than we were even just five or six years well, ago. Well, again, I, I think we learned a lot from Katrina, and I think we made great, from what I can assess, we've made great strides since that point in time. Uh, Mr. Uh, Director Travers, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, a whole of government r rolls off the tongue pretty easily. Uh, I would completely agree with Chris that I mean, I've been doing terrorism pretty much since 9-11. And I do think that the counterterrorism community writ large is the best integrated effort across the entirety because we've been doing it forever. Uh, because we haven't been attacked in the country now, really, you got to go back 10 years to Umar Farouk on something really potentially big. Um, there is a muscle memory issue, uh, it seems to me, in that um, I, I'm big into interagency exercises to just kind of compare notes and who's doing what because new people come around. And uh, while we are much better coordinated than we were, I think it's always useful to get people together and put them through their paces. Okay. Well, I didn't think it was possible, but actually the answer to that last question gave me just a little bit more optimism. And again, let, let me thank you all for your service and like so many of uh, my colleagues on the committee here, please convey to the men and women that serve with you our sincere appreciation for their service and sacrifice. I mean, I think that came across loud and clear and, and we sincerely mean it. That also gives me a uh, fair amount of optimism. When I, when I see the quality of the federal workforce, uh, it, it does make you rest a little bit easier, even though we're facing some pretty complex, pretty difficult threats. So again, thank you for your service. Um, yikes. The hearing record will remain open for 15 days until November 20th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned. <laughs>